Can you imagine if your dad came to you and said, God told me that New York or San Francisco or Tampa is going to be destroyed. The neighbors have decided to kill me because I tried to warn them about it. Load up your camping gear and don't bring anything extra because we're going for a permanent backpacking trip and we're not coming back. What would you do? First Nephi chapter 1 ends with Nephi telling us how the rest of his story shows that the tender mercies of the Lord are over all those whom he hath chosen because of their faith to make them mighty even unto the power of deliverance. The next chapter begins with the first example of this. The Lord speaks to Lehi in a dream. He blesses Lehi for his obedience and warns him of a plot being hatched by a mob to kill him. The Lord instructs him to pack up his family and head into the wilderness. Lehi promptly obeys. He's a great example of obeying God even when it's hard and you can't see the blessings yet. It's a real test to say and do what's right in the face of ridicule, even when you're not risking death for doing so. Lehi's faithful obedience doesn't seem to yield blessings in the short run. In fact, he loses almost everything. He loses his reputation and his relationships with his neighbors so much that they want to take his life. He leaves behind his security, his comfortable lifestyle, and all his wealth. His whole life's work up to this point, and he heads out into no man's land. Perhaps God's been prompting you to do something or make some kind of lifestyle change, but it's difficult for you to take that leap of faith. Maybe it requires leaving the security of a job or a relationship, or perhaps risking the disapproval of people you love. The good news is that you don't have to know all the details of how it will all work out. You can trust in God's faithfulness and just being in relationship with Him. He carries through in unforeseeable ways for those who trust Him, just like Nephi is trying to show us. Now, as we follow the journey of Lehi and his new colony, we'll see that the geography of the Middle East matches up perfectly with what Nephi describes. Here in chapter 2, Nephi gives us two clues. They head south until they reach the borders of the wilderness near the Red Sea. Scholars believe this may have been the Gulf of Aqaba, at the northern tip of the Red Sea. They travel for three days and then stop in a valley by a river. Later chapters tell us that it's fertile and Lehi's family is able to gather food there. This location matches up with the valley of Wadi Taib al Isam, which is a three day journey from the Gulf of Aqaba. It's a fertile location with a canyon, or valley, as well as a year round stream running into the Red Sea. The first thing Lehi does when his family arrives safely at camp is to thank God by building an altar and offering sacrifice to him. They're traveling through the desert and don't know how steady their food supply will be, but Lehi acts in faith, love for God, and gratitude for what he's done for them by sacrificing one of their animals. Laman and Lemuel, on the other hand, are completely focused on temporal things. They don't believe their father or their prophets. Nephi tells us the reason they complain is that they don't understand how God works. They don't put in the effort to get to know God, and therefore they don't trust him. Nothing their father is doing makes sense to them because they lean only on the things of the flesh that can be seen, rather than on the things of the spirit, which can't be seen. They're frustrated with their father. He's leading the family away from the land and wealth they would have inherited one day. They could be continuing to live in luxury and ease, but instead they're trekking through the blistering heat of the Arabian desert. They complain so bitterly that Nephi even likens them unto the Jews who wanted to kill his father. Like the loving father he is, Lehi takes his rebellious sons aside to give them counsel. He uses their surroundings to draw parallels for the relationship they could have with God. He names the river they're camped next to after Laman and shares his hope for this rebellious son that he'll turn to the Lord, the fountain of all righteousness, just like the river that is continually flowing into the fountain of the Red Sea. Next, he talks with Lemuel. Lehi names the valley they've traveled through after him. One scholar points out that the people of the Arabian desert considered valleys their source of strength rather than mountains like we tend to do. Lehi hopes Lemuel will soften his heart and choose to be firm, steadfast, and immovable in obeying the Lord. He wants his sons to enjoy the blessings of following God. Lehi speaks to Laman and Lemuel with the Spirit so powerfully that they are completely confounded, their bodies begin to shake, and they submit in obedience for a time. Moving on, verse 15 contains a curious detail, and my father dwelt in a tent. Some suggest this phrase shows Nephi surprised that his father would leave his luxury and comfort for such a rough and reduced lifestyle. Others believe this may have pointed to the opposite, reflecting a level of religious status or spiritual significance, or perhaps relating to the travel accommodations of those who engaged in the caravan trade. Nephi is young, but he displays a notable level of maturity. Scholars estimate he's probably only between the ages of 16 and 20. Some even speculate that he could have been as young as 14. In biblical times, young men were encouraged to enter marriage shortly after they reached puberty. To be clear, marriages before puberty were forbidden but they were expected to be married by the age of 18, and if they weren't married by 20, they were said to be under a curse. 
Since Nephi is the youngest of four unmarried brothers at this point, the age range of 14 to 18 seems likely. Instead of just blindly following everything his father claims, Nephi takes his questions to the Lord. He shares with us that God visits him and softens his heart so that he believes what his father tells him. Because he is seeking God, Nephi doesn't develop a rebellious spirit like his brothers have. Can you imagine if your dad came to you and said, God told me that New York or San Francisco or Tampa is going to be destroyed. The neighbors have decided to kill me because I tried to warn them about it. Load up your camping gear and don't bring anything extra because we're going for a permanent backpacking trip and we're not coming back. What would you do? Regardless of where we are in our lives, we can ask God to soften our hearts towards His will for us. He will help us to accept His plan and gently guide us until we can eventually see the reasons and the wisdom in it. Nephi talks with each of his brothers. Sam believes him, but Laman and Lemuel won't listen. Nephi is moved by compassion and grief for them. He knows what the Lord has done for his own heart, and he desires the same for them. Maybe you've experienced something similar in your relationships, and most of us have probably spent time in Laman and Lemuel's place too, even if we don't recognize it. Instead of tattling on his older brothers, Nephi chooses to do what will actually help them. He goes straight back to the Lord and prays for them. The Lord responds to Nephi because of his diligence and humility. He promises both blessings and cursings for the Lehite colony in the future. This blessing and curse pattern is laid out in Deuteronomy 28, and we will see it over and over throughout the Book of Mormon. It's pretty simple. Righteousness brings blessings. Rebellion brings curses. The worst part of cursing is alienation from God. He's the source of light, truth, joy, peace, and all that is good. Distancing ourselves from him can only bring emptiness, discontent, and unhappiness. The Lord tells Nephi that if Laman and Lemuel choose to rebel, their descendants will be a scourge to Nephi's descendants. But the good news is that this will still work for their good. There's purpose in our trials. They stir us up in the ways of remembrance and cause us to turn to God again. When we hit rock bottom, we realize that we can't control things. It's a great opportunity to turn to a power higher than ourselves. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is our hope. 